Well, this morning uh, we're going to be looking at uh, John chapter 9 again. And let me just say at the outset, uh, this chapter is a very difficult one to break apart and deal in chunks. So I'm finished breaking it apart now. I'm just going to take the rest of it and deal with it in one, in one uh, fell swoop. And I think you'll see that we, we pretty much have to do that because it's really the account of the man now whose eyes have been opened as he's brought before the Pharisees and they question him and he confesses uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'd like to do is, although it'd be nice to read the first 12 verses, I'm going to start in verse 13 and I'll just uh, ask you to rely upon your memories from last week, what we looked at. Uh, and we'll look now at uh, the man brought before the Pharisees and what he was willing to do. Uh, the price he was willing to pay to confess Jesus. And then what Jesus was willing to do because he was willing to do that at the end. So let's begin reading in verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I wash and I see. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He then answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? They reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing. You do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? So they put him out. Jesus heard that they had put him out, and finding him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say, we see, your sin remains. May the Lord bless uh, this explanation and application of 
of his word. Now, just briefly, last week, we did see that Jesus, who, again, reminds us that he is the light of the world, gave sight to the blind. Uh, Jesus saw a man who had been uh, born blind. He had been blind from birth. A man that we saw that the Lord allowed actually to be born blind so that Jesus might open his eyes, so that Jesus might reveal who he was. Again, this was a mark of the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, the ability to open the eyes of the blind. And when you consider the situation this man was in, I mean, sometimes we think about him. I mean, here, here was someone who had been blind for many years. He had never seen anything, and the purpose of that blindness was so that Jesus might be revealed. Well, we might think that's kind of harsh for this particular individual to be put in this situation for that purpose. But let's back up for a moment and, and look. See, it's a really a very small price to pay for the glory that this man is going to behold for all eternity. He was blind for a few moments in order that his eyes may be opened forever. And the same can be said of us. We were born into this world blind. Perhaps for several years, perhaps only for a few years, but we were blind for a certain period of time, but our eyes too have been opened that we may see the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ and the glories of heaven forever. Certainly worth it. Now this morning we see how the Jewish leaders respond to this miracle. Uh, not well. But we also see how the blind man responds to this mercy that the Lord has shown him. Now instead of being afraid Instead of denying Jesus Christ out of that fear, fear of being put out of the synagogue, out of the church, out of the nation of Israel, literally, he boldly stands his ground and confesses him before those who had the authority to put him out. Now, it's my hope that the Lord will encourage us through this example this morning whose eyes have also been opened by the Lord to do exactly the same thing. Again, I want us to see ourselves in this text because this is why the Lord opened our eyes. This is what he has given us the power to do by his Holy Spirit, boldly to confess Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs him and even in front of those who are hostile toward the gospel. Now we read first in verse 13 that they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now who are the they referred to here? His neighbors and those who knew him as a beggar, those who had seen him as a blind man. And why did they bring him to the Pharisees? Well, it was because they wanted to see what the religious leaders thought about this. You know, whenever something of a spiritual nature took place and even a physical nature, they were supposed to go to the priests, they were supposed to go to the leaders in order that they might evaluate what actually took place. Was this a real miracle that took place here or was this really a hoax? And of course, if this really happened, what were they supposed to do with this? What were they supposed to believe? What were they supposed to think regarding Jesus Christ? Now I want you to notice how John, again, sets, as it were, the situation here, draws our attention to one particular fact, the day on which this took place in verse 14. Now, it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. You know, it seems that Jesus very often healed on the Sabbath, didn't he? Now, did he purposely do this in order to draw attention to himself? Well, I think that was likely one of his motives, even though it wasn't the only one. Uh, this certainly flagged him in the eyes of the Pharisees, and Jesus obviously wanted that to happen so that they would see him and take note of what he was doing in order that some might be saved, but he, knowing at the same time that others would be hardened by this. Now, as I've said, this wasn't the only motive. We need to understand that Jesus was basically doing good all the time. He didn't take a break on the Sabbath. He certainly didn't heal only on the Sabbath. He basically was healing all the time. But he certainly didn't stop when it was the Sabbath. He was always about his father's business. 
Now, really, this is the same business, our Lord tells us, that we are continually to be about His business full time. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 106, verse 3, How blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness at all times. Uh, we should never take a break from doing good. Christianity is not a, a part-time endeavor. It's not a part-time relationship with God, but it's something that the Lord calls us to full-time. Uh, you, by the Lord's mercy and grace, have been betrothed to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, you are the bride of Christ through faith in His name, and that's something that you always are. You are the Father's children by adoption, and that's something that is true of you at all times. You are the citizens of His kingdom. You are the soldiers in His army through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which means that you are to be serving Him as soldiers in His army. And you are to be about His work, not just for six days of the week, but even for seven, including the Lord's Day. Jesus said on another occasion, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Sometimes we think, well, no, this has to be a day of rest, and we rest from everything. Well, what we're supposed to be resting from are the things that would distract us from our love and devotion to the Lord. We are not to take a break from loving Him through our service, loving the saints, loving those outside the church by ministering to them which is why Jesus did this on the Sabbath, again, among other things. Now, as I've said, the Jews brought the man to the Pharisees. And now that he was present, they began to cross-examine him. How is it that you can see, they asked him. And we read in verse 15 his reply. He that is Jesus, and they knew that he was speaking about Jesus, applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Now, they knew that the clay did not really explain anything. They knew that it had very limited medicinal value. What the man was really telling them was that Jesus had done a miracle, Something which we understand they were very reluctant to accept. Something which they seemed to disregard on virtually every occasion, looking for flaws rather than the evidence that here is the Messiah. Now some of them rejected the possibility of a miracle outright. John writes in verse 16. Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Why would God hear the prayers of someone who flagrantly disregards the fourth commandment? At least in the way that they understood it. Well, obviously God wouldn't listen to somebody who sets aside his commandments and does what they want to do. God, as a matter of fact, uh, the blind man is going to say a little bit later in this text, we know that God does not hear sinners. That doesn't mean he doesn't know what they're saying. It just simply means that he's not going to respond to them the way that he would respond to his children who know him because his ears are always open to us. If he's setting aside the laws of God, if he's a sinner, obviously the Lord's not going to listen to him. But of course we need to ask the question, is that what Jesus actually did? Well, of course not, because it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Before you accuse anyone of doing something sinful, you'd better make sure that the standard that you're using isn't just your own opinion. Make sure that it's not the opinion of a particular church tradition. Make sure that it's God's word because that's what he holds us accountable to is what he says and not perhaps what we might like to believe. So there were those who simply rejected him outright but there were others who were struggling from the opposite direction Jesus healed a blind man. How could he do that if he was a matter, of, well, if he was a, a sinner, if he was a Sabbath breaker? We read in verse 16. But others were saying, How can a man who was a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Now, these were right, but apparently they, you know, they didn't know, as it were, they, they uh, didn't know why they were right. Uh, 
Nobody could do what Jesus had done if God were not with him. So how could he be a Sabbath breaker and God still listen to him? Well, when they had reached an impasse, they thought they would call the man or ask him what he thought. Who is this man who healed you? And here was his first opportunity to confess Christ. In verse 17, so they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. Now, I do want you to notice here that I, I believe it's quite possible. I, I think by the time we get to the end, we're going to see that this man did not believe that Jesus was merely a prophet, but that he was the prophet, the one that God promised through Moses he was going to send into the world. Basically, the man was saying, you're right, God does not hear sinners, but he did hear this man. He must be sent from God. He is a prophet. He is the prophet. Now, this appears to be more than either group was really willing to accept. They then began to question whether there had really been a miracle in the first place. Well, you know what? You're right. God doesn't hear sinners, so how could a miracle have taken place? Perhaps this man was trying to deceive them. Perhaps he had never been born blind in the first place. Maybe he had some kind of an interest in promoting Jesus Christ. Well, to settle the question, they decided to call more witnesses. His parents. I mean, who would know better than his parents? John writes in verses 18 and 19. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been born blind and had received sight until... They called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? Well, you know, the parents seem to be wondering exactly the same thing. His parents say in verses 20 and 21, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes? We do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Now I do want you to notice again why the parents said this particular thing in verses 22 and 23. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him, that is Jesus, to be the Christ, that is the Messiah, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Now notice their fear betrays the fact that they knew Jesus actually had done this miracle. Or at the very least, they suspected that he had. But they also knew that if they admitted that, they would be put out of the synagogue and they did not want to run that risk. Well, what does that mean, to be put out of the synagogue? Well, it means that you, if you were in the synagogue and put out, would be excluded from the only means by which you might enter into God's kingdom. As a matter of fact, you'd be excluded from God's kingdom. You would be shunned by the people. You know, it's, it's true that... Jehovah's Witnesses, one of the things they do to keep people in their organization is that they uh, threaten them with shunning. If you get put out of this organization, not only will you be condemned, and in their case it means being burned up or annihilated because they don't believe in hell, but we're going to have nothing to do with you. Okay? They shun them. Well, that's exactly what would have happened to anyone put out of the synagogue. They would be shunned. As a matter of fact they would be essentially put out of the nation of Israel. They would be people without a nation. So instead of answering the question by which they might actually end up being put out of the synagogue, they pointed back to their son who was old enough to answer the question for himself. Again, this was not a, a young man. It wasn't an old man, I mean, but he wasn't a child. He was somebody who was a son of the law, old enough to answer the questions, old enough to stand up, for what he had done himself. Now let's stop and just reflect on these parents for a moment. Those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, who don't have his resurrection power at work within their souls, working within their hearts, creating this desire for the Lord Jesus Christ to trust him, will not be willing to confess him in most cases, but certainly not if the cost is too high. 
Remember the parable of the sower? Some of the seed fell into stony ground and it didn't have much depth of soil, so all the growth came above the surface and it looked rich, it looked you know, promising, and yet there was no fruit. And as soon as a trial came by, it withered. Well, that's what we might have in a case like this. If, if you are, are willing only to own Jesus Christ as long as it doesn't cost you anything, only those who truly know him and love him are willing to pay this price. Now again, they point back to the Son because they don't want the Jews to, to come after them. They don't want to be put out of the synagogue. They don't want to confess Jesus Christ because they don't know him. It's not that they didn't care for their son. It's just that they were afraid of the Jews. You know, it's, it's a hard thing even to stand up for the truth in front of your friends. You know, people that, that you know, people that at least at some level care about you. But how much more difficult is it when it means that you have to stand in front of the leaders of the nation, the leaders of the church, those who have the keys, as it were, to the kingdom of heaven, and face being thrown out of those things? How much more difficult is it to confess the Lord Jesus Christ when you might have to face prison? You know, sometimes the Lord calls us to be willing to pay even that price, even to, um, to face death for his name. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 32 through 33, as we um, saw in our meditation, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. This passage tells us that we may not deny Jesus Christ when it becomes convenient for us or when we want to just escape the persecution. We need to be willing to confess him no matter what it is we're faced with. I mean, think of a contemporary example, Saeed Abedini. He was imprisoned in uh, 2012 because he was planting churches in Iran, in a place they didn't want churches, in a place that hated the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was willing to continue to confess the Lord Jesus Christ before a nation that hates him, even though they had the power to put him in prison. That's exactly what they did, and he would not deny the Lord Jesus Christ, and he suffered for many years because of this. The question that our text asks us this morning is, are you willing to do the same thing? Well, you are willing if you know the Lord Jesus Christ because he has made you willing. You must confess Jesus Christ because you love him. You really cannot do otherwise. You really won't be able to bear the thought that our Lord Jesus Christ actually came to this world and stood his ground for you and did not deny his father or his purpose in front of the nation of Israel so that he might bring salvation to you and then you would turn around and deny that you even know him. Now, I should mention, too, there are times when we actually do that, when we do deny him, but we confess our sins and we repent and we renew our desire to love and serve him. We don't just keep denying him because if we do, that shows we really don't love him. Now, look, this man's parents were not willing to confess him because they did not know him. But the same was not true of the man who had received the Lord's mercy. When the Pharisees didn't gain what they wanted from the parents, they were thinking they could debunk this guy right away by proving he never really was blind. Now they're convinced that he is and that this actually did happen to him. They brought the man in again. And we read in verse 24. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Basically what they were saying is this, You need to come clean with us. You need to obey God, which up to this point you haven't. You need to agree with us that this man who supposedly healed you is not a righteous man. Give glory to God. Tell the truth. He's a Sabbath breaker. He can't be from God. He could not have been the one who healed you. It appears at this point now they're united. I mean, because you don't hear the dissenting voices now. Or if they're not united, at least the group that before was questioning is now silent. 
Maybe because they too were afraid they might get thrown out of the, out of the synagogue. <clears throat> but notice the man was not willing to deny Jesus. He had to confess him. Verse 25, he then answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. I want you to notice something similar to what we've seen before with Jesus talking to the woman at the well. They're introducing this, this other topic, this man is a sinner. He steps around this accusation that Jesus could be a sinner and he gets to the heart of the matter, what Jesus had done for him. I was blind, but now I see. Now, as, I, well, as we saw before, when you confess the Lord Jesus Christ before others, it's best not to get sidetracked into theological issues or to talk about things that you don't know, but to stick to what you do know. I mean, what is it that's true about you that was also true about him? You were blind, but now you see. You couldn't see a way out of God's judgment, which you knew was yours simply because of conscience. But Jesus opened your eyes. You turned to him in faith. He forgave you of your sins. And now you have the hope of heaven. Stick to the gospel. That's really what's most important. Now I want you to notice as well that this man was willing to do this in the face of those whom he knew very likely would put him out of the synagogue and cut him off from the nation of Israel. There are often consequences connected with sharing the gospel with others. Are you willing to accept those consequences? Are you willing to pay the price? You need to realize too that there are consequences for not sharing the gospel that we do need to understand. Not just the fact that we dishonor the Lord, and that if we continually don't confess him before men, he will disown us before the Father. But what about those who never hear the gospel? What's going to happen to them? Well, if they don't hear the gospel, they're not going to repent. They're not going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are going to have to suffer the consequences for their sins. And they will suffer for an eternity. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, can we live with that? Can we live with people dying around us who don't know Jesus Christ and they don't know him because perhaps they've never heard the gospel? Or maybe they need an example. They need to see somebody who really does believe this. Maybe this is what the Lord is going to use to turn them. I mean, can we live with the fact that they're perishing and we have something that could save them and yet we're not sharing it with them? Those are things that we need to think about. The consequences of not confessing the Lord Jesus Christ can be severe. Now, this brought them, again, back to the original question, the fact that he wasn't willing to, to agree with them that Jesus was a sinner, but that he really did open his eyes. How is this man who was blind able to see? How can we answer this question? So they said in verse 26, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? At this point, I think we see a change, perhaps, or perhaps uh, maybe a little bit more aggressiveness in the man. He seems to be gaining momentum. He's even a little bit bolder in his response to them, and he does seem to begin to speak to them with a greater wisdom. Remember what our Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples when he sent them out. If you were brought before kings and governors, before those in authority, don't be afraid or think ahead of time, what am I going to say? Because it will be given to you in that very hour what you are to say. The Lord helps us in situations like this. This man shows every sign. The Spirit of God was there at work in his heart helping him. So he's, in verse 27, he answered them, I told you already and you did not listen, why do you want to hear it again? And then he says this, you do not want to become his disciples too, do you? I mean, his answer does sound a bit on the sarcastic side. It's highly unlikely that they want to become Jesus' disciples, but yet he seems to be chiding them. I mean, really, what other purpose could you have? Now, I do want you to notice he says too, 
You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? This man had already become Jesus' disciple. Now here's another indication that the man may have known already in his heart. Even though he had never seen Jesus, the one who healed him, the one he is defending, the one he is confessing, is no mere man and no mere prophet, but he is the Messiah. Now they obviously didn't appreciate this remark, and so we read in verses 28 and 29, they reviled him and said, you were his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. You know, if these Jews had only understood who Jesus was, and what it is he had come to do. And if they had only understood Moses and what he meant when he said, the Lord would raise up a prophet like himself, then they could have seen that it wasn't contradictory to be the disciples of both men. They would have received Jesus because they were disciples of Moses, not, not received Jesus because they were his disciples, but they weren't willing because they were blind, because they did not know what Moses actually said. So now the man goes even further, verse 30. The man answered and said to them, well here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. Here's somebody you know so very little about, and yet he did a great miracle. The fact that he did this miracle must mean that God heard him, which means that he must be a righteous man. Verse 31, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. This must be true of Jesus. He not only did a miracle, the man says, but he did an extraordinary miracle. Even among miracles, there are some that are greater than others. Verse 32, since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. You know, if you search through the scriptures, you'll find that's true. There was one instance where there was an army that was coming against Elisha, and, um, you know, his servant was afraid, and so, the, so Elisha prayed that the Lord would open his servant's eyes, and he saw this great army, but he also prayed that the Lord would blind that army. They weren't absolutely blind. They just couldn't see certain things. And then... Uh, Elisha prayed again and the Lord opened their eyes. That's the closest thing we have to people who are blind being made able to see. But it is true, there is no record of somebody being healed that was born physically absolutely blind. And why is that? Well, as we saw last time, this was the one miracle that was reserved for the Messiah. It was the, one of the ways and perhaps the, one of the primary ways that God's people were to recognize him. We read in Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7, again speaking about the Messiah, the Lord speaking to the Messiah, he says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Now Jesus did heal blind men on several occasions and it was to show that he was the Messiah, the one who was able to open not just physically blind eyes, but those which are spiritually blind. And so what was the blind man's, the man who was formerly blind, what was his conclusion about Jesus? He says in verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. God must have sent him. Now again, I told you, I think he knew who Jesus really was already because why else would he risk what he is risking right now, being put out of the synagogue? He knew this was at stake. And I believe that this conclusion is strengthened by the fact that that's exactly what they did to him. I mean, look what happens in verse 34. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins. And again, what they meant by that was what we saw last time. The fact that he was born blind means they thought that he came into the world as a sinner greater than 
other sinners because we all come into the world as sinners. The fact that God afflicted him meant that he was born in sin. You were born entirely in sins. And are you teaching us? So they put him out. They excommunicated him. Now remember, they had only threatened to do this to anyone who was willing to say that Jesus was the Christ. And here was this man defending Jesus, and in their estimation, as the Christ. So he confessed Christ. He was willing to do that. Jesus opened his eyes, and he was indebted. He had opened his eyes in more ways than one. His heart was filled with love and admiration for Jesus Christ, and now he had the opportunity to show that love by confessing Jesus before the leaders of Israel. Even though it meant he was going to be put out, he confessed Jesus, and he was put out. Now, what did our Lord Jesus Christ do? Did he say, oh, tough luck, I guess my good deed, you know, no good, un no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, this guy, I thought I was doing him a favor, but it looks like he ended up getting cut off out of Israel. Well, that's too bad. No, our Lord Jesus Christ actually goes looking for the man now because he heard he had been put out of the synagogue in order to find him. The blind man had never seen Jesus. Remember, Jesus had gone by the time he got back from the pool of Siloam. But now he goes looking for him and he finds him that Jesus might own this man and confirm his faith that what he had done was not for nothing. In verse 35, we read this, Jesus heard that, he, or that they had put him out. And finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Why does Jesus ask questions to which he already knows the answer? <clears throat> it's because he wants to confirm the faith of those he's asking. Either their unbelief or their belief. Jesus knew how the man was going to answer. Uh, because he already knew the price the man had paid for his willingness to confess him before the leaders of Israel. Well, this is what the man responds in verses 36 to 38. He answered, Who is he, Lord? Notice he calls Jesus Lord, that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe and he worshipped him. I want you to notice that he was willing to believe because he knew this one who was in front of him from his voice was the one who had done this thing and he knew the one who had done this thing was the Messiah and when he knew the one standing talking to him was the Messiah he confessed that belief. He accepted him. He had already believed in him but he receives him as his Lord and he worships him. I think that's quite interesting because it, it does seem as though it wasn't plain to Israel that the Messiah was God in human flesh. But here this man already sees it. And he worships Jesus. He sees more than what might appear on the surface. He understands that this one is God because God alone is to be worshipped. You do not worship those who are not deity. And those certainly who attempted it were rebuked. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him because Jesus is God. He receives worship. So in closing, we should ask these questions. Let me ask them to you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? That he is not only the Son of Man, that is, he's taken our nature upon himself, but that he is also the Son of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he is the only savior of the world? And believing that, have you trusted him? Are you worshiping him? Are you worshiping him with your whole life? Are you confessing him before others? Why should you do that? Why should I do that? Because Jesus is worthy. He's worthy that you should confess him. I mean, again, consider what he has done for you. He loved you. He came into the world to save you. He is worthy that you should confess him. And by the power of the Holy Spirit working in your heart, you know that that is what you want to do. I would encourage you, confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus, I want you to listen to one other thing. I want you to listen to how Jesus concludes what he is saying to this man who was born blind. 
And what he says almost sounds contradictory at first, but I think you understand. Verse 39. And Jesus said to the man, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Well, Jesus tells the man that he came into the world to open the eyes of the blind so that those who do not see may see, so that those who are blinded by sin might see him, that they might trust in him, that they might be saved. Now, is it possible to see your blindness without having your eyes opened? I do think that is possible. That's why the Lord, of course, gives us the commandments and he shows us all the different things he shows us about what is true of believers and what's true of unbelievers. If you see your blindness this morning and that you are without hope apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to understand that you are the one he came into the world to seek that he might open your eyes. He came into the world to reveal his glory and his salvation to you. And that's exactly what he will do if you will come to him in faith, if you will come to him in repentance. But if, on the other hand, you believe that you see just fine, your life is fine, everything's going well with you, and that God's going to accept you apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to understand that Jesus also came so that those who see, or at least who think they see, might become blind. Uh, listen to what John writes regarding the response of the Pharisees who apparently were standing close by, at least some of them were, verses 40 and 41. Those of the Pharisees who were with him, that is with Jesus, heard these things and said to him, we are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. As long as you think that you don't need Jesus, as long as you think that you see, you're never going to come to him. You're never going to leave your sin behind because you are blinded by your sin. You will never see your need of Christ and come to him. You need to confess your blindness that you need the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to look to him in faith to open your eyes. If you do, the Lord will show you mercy. If you confess your blindness, your need of him, he will save you. Just look to him in faith and he will give you his mercy. Well, let, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us do that.